And so the conversation's starting a bit, but people still generally are confused, even in the church. Huh. Why is everything, like I get complaints all the time. Why is everything so expensive? I went to the grocery store and spent $80 and it wasn't even enough food to feed me for three days. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Pastor Alan Armstrong, welcome to the What Is Money show. So glad to be here, Robert. I've been a big fan, love the show, listen to it when I'm out and about working, doing my thing. So uh, yeah, your show's been a great blessing to me and uh, just really happy to be here. I'm honored to hear that. Um, I I think you've been doing some great work as well. Um, a lot of which we will talk about today. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, you also go by Pastor Coin on Twitter, and you are the author of the book, The Bible and Bitcoin. And you've been putting out some really good tweets lately. Um, and, you know, we I co-authored the book, Thank God for Bitcoin. So this is an area we've explored before, just like the, the moral and ethical dimensions of Bitcoin through a Judeo-Christian lens. And I think there's a lot, a lot we can learn uh, about the nature of money. Um, it, I think you pointed out too, how many times the word money is used in the Bible, how many monetary metaphors there are, you know, and talk about, you know, when you use terms like redemption and um, things like that. So it's a, there's a lot of interesting areas to kind of work through. Um, and to get started, I thought we'd jump on to one of your tweets, which was, you said that fiat money is the elephant in the room of Christian ethics. Um, and I think you've had, as you said earlier, you don't have much hair cause you've been pulling out your hair, sort of arguing with Christians about, uh, I guess fiat money and perhaps Bitcoin and its relationship to the biblical corpus. So what, could you elaborate on that? What is, what is this elephant in the room that is fiat money um, in regard to Christian ethics? Well, it was a couple nights ago and I was thinking about posting on Twitter and I was like, I don't know what to say anymore. You know, what, what do I say? You know, sometimes you just get writer's block or whatever. And uh, this metaphor came to mind of, of an elephant in the church 
And I thought that's 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 a cool metaphor. So I just went with it. And honestly, I just threw it on Twitter. I didn't think it'd get any traction. And I woke up and it blew up. I was like, wow, okay. Um, the the idea there was that in Christian ethics, we the church do a do a pretty good job of standing t- up for um, good things and standing against evil things. Uh, you know, the church does a good job of standing against like abortion and um and perversion and these type of things but there's this massive elephant in the church called fiat money theft uh, that we just don't discuss or don't know is there half the time i've talked to a, since releasing my book i've uh i i did an experiment in just in my city to see how many pastors i know friends of mine would be interested and in rather reading this book um, zero were interested. And it wasn't like they were, uh, they weren't mean about it or anything like that. It was just like, Hey man, I wrote this book. Kind of want to get your take on it. Would you be interested in reading it? And it was just like, no, I don't have time. No, thanks. Not interested. And I I was kind of shocked. I thought at least one or two might bite, Mm -hmm. but I don't know if it's my city or whatever, but there's this elephant in the room of of just outright theft so in the book there's a study guide in the back and i did it's a six-week study i did this study as a beta test before i released it with my church and when people discovered the way the fiat system works how inflation works how money printing works jaws dropped there was one particular session i remember where people were just silenced. They could not believe how immoral the system was. And some people even said like, wow, I did not think this was a big deal. One woman said, I joined this study just for something to do. I wasn't even interested in Bitcoin. I wasn't even interested in talking about money. But when when people realize just how wicked and immoral the system is, their jaws often hit the floor. And so this is the the elephant. Nobody talks about it. Um, in all my years in the church, I've never heard a single sermon about fiat money or ethics concerning money outside of just be honest, don't steal. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to go deeper. And there's an elephant here in the church. And and now it's starting to step on some toes. Mm. And people are starting to feel feel the pain of inflation and feel the pain of of the fiat monetary system and it's 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 unequal weight and unequal measure. And so the conversation's starting a bit, but people still generally are confused, even in the church. Huh. Why is everything like I get complaints all the time? Why is everything so expensive? I went to the grocery store and spent $80 and it wasn't even enough food to feed me for three days. People are feeling the pain. And so with the fiat elephant, uh, he's starting to creep out of uh, uh, the obscure, dark corners of the church, and he's starting to step on some toes. And now people are are, are beginning to want to have this conversation. So I'm glad it's happening. Uh, I wrote the book for that very reason. And um, Lord willing, uh, we can orange pill uh, the church and opt out of this wicked system. Uh, and you're striking a chord with a, a phrase we use all the time on the show, which is pain as information. So when people start to feel the pain, they start to put themselves into new formations, typically asking questions, you know, what is the source of this? What can I do about it? Et cetera. So the, the iron, the proverbial iron is definitely hot. I think for these types of conversations for people to understand the nature, the immoral nature of, of fiat money and taxation more generally, right? Because ultimately inflation is just a invisible or less visible form of taxation, yeah. um, which is theft. Taxation is theft. Inflation is theft. These are all kind of the same thing. Is that part of the elephant in the room? That ta- is taxation discussed inside of the church or is it just more fiat money inflation? <laughs> taxation is discussed, but it's discussed uh, inappropriately, I-, I think. It's discussed as a sort of... Um, Christian duty almost. You get this. I mean, nobody will say it in those terms. No one will say it's your Christian duty to pay your taxes. But the the the, the vibe, I don't like using that word, but the vibe is it's your duty. And if you don't do it, it's almost like you're sinning if you if you oppose the state. 
I, I don't know if it's like this elsewhere in the world with Christians. I don't know. But in the West, Canada, United States, it seems that way. It's almost your Christian duty to pay your taxes. And if you if you go against that or, or speak against that, uh, you got a, a group of Christians that will just surround you and, and attack you. And I mean, I've been attacked um, for my views on taxation in the Bible many times locally and online. The issue is really an issue of education, right? In that first tweet with the elephant stuff, I, I said that they're not teaching fiat, uh, how the fiat system works in schools. And a lot of times, unfortunately, that you can expect the same thing in the churches. So in the church, you're not learning about it. In the school, you're not learning about it. There's just seems to be this um, blindness to asking any deeper questions about money. Mm -hmm. You just take it for granted. You grow up and your parents teach you, this is money, the dollar. You go to work, you get paid in it. This is how you buy things. This is how you pay taxes. So there's a, there's definitely, it's taken for granted. Mm -hmm. And if you got, if you start to go deeper into this, people start to view you as sort of a wacko. Like, mm -hmm. come on, man, just, just, just pay your taxes, be quiet. We, you, like there's that saying, uh, there's two things guaranteed in life, death and taxes. Uh-huh. Why? Why? Why does it have to, has anybody stopped and said, why? Why do taxes have to be guaranteed? That phrase seems like a status psyop to just get you to shut your mouth and, uh, and, and submit to, to the enslavement of, of the state. That's how it seems to me. Yeah, it's uh, it's almost hidden in plain sight, I guess. Right, that we're just I always like the fish and water analogy that we're just all swimming in money all the time. Rarely do we stop to consider what it actually is, the nature of this economic fluid we're all immersed in. Mm. And um, yeah, the, you know the the certainties, right? Death and taxes, the two certainties in life. I do think it's interesting that. 21 million Bitcoin is like the third certainty. It's the third thing mm. we've ever created that is certain. And I think it caught, maybe it, we end up with just two certainties as a result of Bitcoin again. It'd be like yeah. death and 21 million Bitcoin versus mm -hmm. taxation. So. Uh, that, that, that's a better outcome. That's a better outcome. So you, I think part of what got you in trouble in Christian circles is you said, you described taxation as sin. Mm. And now for me, intuitively, it, if you understand that one of the Ten Commandments is thou shall not steal, and you understand that taxation is a unilateral transfer of wealth under the threat of force, therefore taxation is theft, therefore taxation is sin, it makes perfectly logical sense to me. Um, but it did not land that way in Christian circles for you. So could you can we go into that a bit and maybe talk about the 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 infamous passage that most people cite when we get on this topic, which is the the render unto Caesar passage. Yes, there's so much to unpack here. So first, let me give, give the reason why I phrased it that way, because that was a very intentional phrasing, and it wasn't something I just haphazardly threw together. I, I thought about it um, for, for a while before I posted it. The reason I phrased it as taxation is sin was because, like you said, the Bible says, you shall not steal. If stealing is a sin and taxation is theft, then those two words, theft and sin, should be interchangeable in, in any sentence. I knew it would strike a chord, but I wanted to get the conversation started. So I went ahead and did it anyways. Taxation is sin. And it's really simple because you shall not steal. Now, God says, you shall not steal. Why? Well, the implication is because personal property rights are real. It's a thing. And personal property rights don't come from, um, from each other. We don't give each other property rights. Property rights come from God. When God made humanity, he says, he said, I will make them in my image, male and female. He made them in his image. He made them. His image in us is it's it. A lot of people get too uh, 
uh, I don't know, I, I don't want to say too spiritual, but too mystical about this whole idea of being made in God's image. Oh, what is it? Is it your your mind, your spirit? God defines it right after he makes man. He says, to be made in his image means we are given dominion of the earth to subdue and rule over it. Hmm. This is what it means to be made in God's image. God puts you on the earth to image him. You are like a mirror in a sense. He creates the world. He speaks it into existence. He takes this chaos and he reorders it. That's why the days of creation, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, are so uh, uh, ordered. One, day one, this, day two, this, day three, this. It's because he's putting into order what is chaotic. God puts us here and says, do that. Keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Take the creation, which if left to itself, becomes chaotic. Right. There's I there's this idea that if you just leave creation to itself, that that's the perfect outcome, as if human interaction with creation is bad and we destroy it. No, that's not the that's not the case. God put us here to put it in order. Look, don't cut your grass all summer and tell me how orderly things get. They, it doesn't. It becomes chaotic. So God says, go and put it into order, rule over it, do what I do on a micro scale. So that's what it means to be made in God's image. So with that background, we now come to you shall not steal. Why? Because you are an imager who is uh, a mandated to rule creation, to bring it into order. You can't do that unless you can actually own things. Uh -huh. You can't do that unless you can actually own land and, and, and other resources in order to bring this chaotic creation into order, into a place where human beings can live in a mutually um, beneficial place. Okay, so you shall not steal. That's the idea. Because you're made in God's image, you can't steal from another imager because now you are undermining the reason you were created. It's very, very significant. Then you get to um, the Israelites in the book of 1 Samuel, and God is their king. They have no king. And they go to the prophet Samuel, and they say, give us a king like the other nations. And Samuel says, guys, you don't want that. Why do you want a king? Why do you want a man to rule over you when you have God ruling over you? Isn't it better to have God to rule over you than, than, than a man? And they say, no, Samuel, we want a king. The other nations have a king. We want one too. So Samuel goes to God and he's upset. He says, God, your people, why do they? And God says, tell this to the people. Okay, you can have a king, but just be warned. This is what he will do. And he goes through a list of things kings do. He's going to take your sons and daughters and put them to work for him. He's going he's gonna to tax you. Taxation was actually a warning from God. <laughs> When you go back uh, uh, to the to the origin of, uh, of the kings of Israel, God says, literally, taxation is a warning. Like, guys, are you sure he's going to tax you? You still want it? Yeah. And then he goes through these other things and the people say, yeah, give us a king anyways. So the people chose this. God warned them and they still chose it. Now we go to Jesus and here come the Pharisees. Guys, we're going to catch Jesus in his words. We're going to ask them about taxes. Um, brilliant strategy. If you're dealing with anyone but Jesus, it's a brilliant stra strategy. You want to catch someone in their words? Let's talk about taxes. Get them in trouble. So they say, "Is it you know, teacher, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, here's Jesus. He's between a rock and a hard place now. If he says, yes, pay taxes, then, then all the Jews who are being oppressed with these taxes, who hate these taxes, are going to turn on Jesus. But if he says, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, um, perhaps all the Jews will love him. <clears throat> but then the Pharisees just go to Rome and say, hey, this guy's teaching not to pay taxes. And then Rome will do the dirty work for them. So what does Jesus do? In both cases, he's he's in trouble. Well, of course, Jesus is, a, is, a, is the son of God. And you can't just expect to twist him in his words because he is the word. Imagine going to the word, the, the, <laughs> the logos, and thinking you could twist them in his words insane. So he instead says, show me the coin for the taxes. So they pull out, pull out a, 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 a Daenerys. Who, whose inscription is on the coin? Well, it's Caesar's. Okay. Render to Caesar, therefore, what is Caesar's and to God, what is God's? And the story ends. Okay. Like 
what what wait a minute you can't just end the story there guys <laughs> what's going on here this is this is too significant jesus was not telling them yeah pay taxes it's great caesar's awesome i love him he's a great guy pay him pay, pay. no what he was doing was trying to get them to think uh think bigger here the inscription on the coin, it's Caesar's. Mm -hmm. Give to God what is God's. Well, ask the question. Ask the same question of God as you did of Caesar. Where is God's likeness and in inscription? It's in you. It's in me. Genesis chapter 1. We just discussed it. You are made in God's image. You bear his likeness. His inscription is you. So give to God, therefore, what is God's? Give yourself to God, all of yourself to God. How does that look? Well, that looks like pre-King Israel. That looks like a, a, a people who have God as their ruler and understand these basic principles. You shall not steal. What Jesus was saying when he said, give to God what is God's is give yourself to him. And if all of you do that, if all of you give yourself to God, then Caesar fades into irrelevance because Caesar now has no authority. So this is what Jesus is trying to get us to think. He's trying to, he, it's, it's amazing to me that people will say, oh, Jesus, he's such a deep thinker. He's such a brilliant teacher. And then when it comes to taxation, he just says, yeah, just pay it. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. It's a, I mean, it's a glaring misinterpretation and, um, I, I'm always surprised when people try to use that to justify taxation because it's pretty clear to me what what he's saying, right? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. And as you said too, it almost harkens back to Genesis 1, right? Where God has inscribed his image onto us so that we are God's. We are owned by God, not by Caesar. So give to God yourself, your energy, your labor, your talents, and give to Caesar nothing, basically. Um, right. I want to. You give to God what is God. You starve Caesar of yeah. his godhood. Right, right. Because right. It, you know Caesar, Caesar exalted himself as a god, right? Yeah. And 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 whether or not you want to believe it or not, the state does the same thing today, right? Like the president, the prime minister. He's not going to go on TV and say, "I am God." He's not going to use those words. But practically speaking, the state has exalted itself as a god. And this is the dollar, the, right? And God, which right? it's all well, the yeah, dollar, wh God. which God they need to put the lower G on the on the dollar because That's it's right. not the uppercase G. But um, they have exalted themselves as God. And at least in Canada, where I live, every election cycle, it's the same thing. What are we asking of the politicians that the, the thing we ought to be asking of God? How are you going to provide for me, mm -hmm. states? How are you going to bless me, states? How are you going to take my problems and fix them, states? We pray to the states instead of, these are the questions we need to ask of God. God, uh, please bless me. Please uh, prosper me. Please provide for me. These are the things we pray to God. But instead, we've redirected the prayers to the state because the state is just like Caesar exalting himself as God. So Jesus says, give to God what is God's. It's pretty simple. Yeah, and this... Conversation sounds like it's taking a, a very significant theological turn, but I think just to sort of play the other side of this, there's also a very strong rational basis for this idea. Uh, again, God as the word, right? Or the logos or something close to rationality itself. It is rational that if we allow theft or justify theft as a standard, right? If we systemize it in taxation or inflation, then we actually destroy our ability to produce. Yeah. Um, Ayn Rand has this great quote that says, when force becomes the standard, then the murderer is superior to the pickpocket. Wow. So you're actually incentivizing people to pursue the political means of wealth acquisition versus the economic means of trade and production. Yeah. And when you do that, I mean, you've, you've broken the, the rational incentives that keep us together, right? That keep us treating each other as rational beings. If we're stealing from one another, we're treating one another as means to an end rather than ends in ourselves. Right. And so if theft is justified or or legally enshrined even as it is with taxation and inflation, then civilization disappears over time and a spread of ruin and slaughter. Mm -hmm. um, 
another to cite one more Rand quote, she says, when men fail to deal with each other through money, then men become the tools of other men. Mm. You know, this labor is yeah, very theological. Again, what obviously is coming from the Bible, but there's a very rational, hard, um, almost inarguable basis to what Christ is is saying here and what's being imparted in the Bible. And I think that's very, very interesting. Right. And if God is the origin of of intelligibility, we ought to expect what he commands for us to make total rational sense and to work. Yes. Right. And, and it does work and it does make rational sense. You don't have to be a Christian to realize this just makes sense. Like if you don't steal from another human, things will go better for both of you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code Bitcoin23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. I want to ask you too, on this, on this line of query here, you said earlier that the church does a great job of kind of, you know, defending what is good and, and um, calling out what is evil to some extent. I think you said too, that was the point of the government in the Bible was like to promote the good and punish evil, something to that effect. Yeah. How are good and evil defined in the Bible? Well, there's several metaphors that the Bible uses to illustrate good and evil and help define it. Um, a lot of them we use in just daily life, maybe not realizing that it comes from that. Uh, w one of the, the better ones I like is the illustration of light versus darkness. Um, first John tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And again, you go back to Genesis 1. Let me I'll just say this for all the listeners who are Bible students. And maybe if you're not a Bible student um, and you want to become one, here's a great tip. Uh, study Genesis 1 to 3 a lot. Get a lot of interpretation, a lot of comment. Understand it because almost every other concept in the Bible you can trace back to Genesis 1. It's really fascinating. Hmm. So this idea of light and darkness, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Well, what, what does God say? He says, let there be light. It's the first, the first words of God you hear in the Bible or read in the Bible are, let there be light. Let yeah, there be light. Yeah, exactly. And and that's a whole nother thing. We can talk about the the divine fiat and the carnal fiat. Maybe we'll yes. get into that later. But um, the the so God so 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 the, God is light. In Him is no darkness at all. It's very simple. How, how does the Bible define good and evil? Good is anything which proceeds from God. Evil is anything that has the absence of God. Hmm. That's basically it. Hmm. So all the commandments. Uh, that God gives the Ten Commandments and the ethical standards of the Lord are simply um, overflows of God's being. Mm. That's all it is. Uh, you shall not steal. Why? Because God uh, uh, does not have in him um, theft, fraud. God is not fraud. God is truth. God is honesty. God is uh, all, all things which are honorable. So you shall not steal because this is God's nature. You shall not commit adultery. Well, why? Because God is faithful. You shall not have other gods. That commandment, you shall not have other gods and you shall not have adult or you shall not commit adultery are essentially fundamentally the, the same thing. Because in the Bible, we see that idolatry is spiritual adultery. God calls his people whores in the Bible. The prophets call the Israelites whores because they've whored after other gods. It's this idea of faithfulness, truth, honesty. This is um, 
how we understand good and evil because it's it's God's very character and it's his very nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's I really like that metaphor that almost like evil as the absence of the good or God, mm-hmm. just as darkness is the absence of light. Right. And this this is the idea of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil uh comes from this sort of um this metaphor where there's this tree and he God says you know, there's all these trees, there's everything I've given you, everything, just do not eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, you know, a, a lot of times um, in talking with uh, a skeptics, they'll, they'll say, well, why does God not want them to eat that? Well, doesn't he want them to know good and evil? Mm-hmm. Why is he keeping knowledge from from Adam and Eve? That seems like, let's let's give them knowledge. That seems like a good and, a good and honorable thing to do. But here's the, uh, <laughs> I don't know why you'd want that, first of all, Think about it. Adam and Eve are in the garden. God is with them. They already know what is good. That's already a thing. What God is saying is don't eat from that tree or else now you'll know evil. Everybody wants to live in peace. Well, maybe not everybody, but generally speaking, we want peace. We want order. We want to live in a world where there's no violence. There's no theft, where we can all... uh, uh, live together and help each other and prosper and be healthy and so forth. Everybody wants that, but nobody, but nobody wants to give up the knowledge of evil to get there. Mm. Right? So what God is saying is, what God was doing was not saying, I'm keeping a secret from you that will help you. Mm-hmm. What he's doing is saying, if you eat from this, bad things will happen because you will attain the knowledge of evil, which you don't want and why would you want that when you already have all good? Mm. So it, this is the idea here uh, with the light and the darkness, the good and evil. God's not withholding anything. He's protecting them in the same way the commandments do the same thing to us now. Uh, people read the commandments, oh, it's so repressive. And, and no, it's freedom. Freedom is not doing whatever you want. Freedom is knowing what the good is and being able to do it without hindrance. Yes. All, submitting to the truth or submitting yes. to what is good. Yeah. I like that analogy a lot too, that um, it, well, for a simple one, like we all drive, you know, in the U.S. on the right-hand side of the road. That's not freedom. Just pick whichever side of the road you want to drive on and drive on it. It's a submission to a rule, but to the extent that we all submit to it, we actually gain more freedom, right? That we can drive okay. without having the chaos of frequent car accidents. Um, so there's this this deeper idea of like, yeah, freedom is not a free-for-all necessarily. It's it's according yourselves with what is most truthful or most good or most useful. Um, I think too you mentioned that studying Genesis 1, uh, the stories in Genesis 1, these things way predate the Bible, right? These are like some of the most ancient stories ever told. So for those that might be resistant to the ideas of Christianity, which I know many Bitcoiners are, it's like you could look at it just like that. You're studying some of the oldest stories ever told, things that come way before the Bible even. Um, so there's, you know, it's not, you don't even have to interpret it theologically per se. There's a, there's a philosophical dimension to these stories. There's a cosmological dimension to these stories. And um, and you mentioned just- too, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's wild to me that people. Okay, I get it. You're not a Christian. You don't you don't believe in God. Okay, whatever. But doesn't it pique your curiosity a bit that this these stories have literally lasted millennium, millennia? Maybe is the right term. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason for that. Yes. And let's not be so arrogant as to to you know I- ignore it because we think we're somehow more enlightened than all of our ancestors who've got us to this point. I've never understood how Bitcoiners can appreciate the Lindy effect, but then dispense with all mythology and religion. Yeah. It's like, that's what, it's almost the same thing, right? This thing, these stories have been around for so long. They're useful for some reason, whether, whether or not you can understand the reason does not give you the, uh, I guess, authority to just dispense with them as if they're fairy tales of some kind. Yeah. Um, okay. And you mentioned, I think it in Genesis one, right? Let there be light. Mm-hmm. Which in, I think this is an ancient Greek. I might be wrong. The translation, it's, it's fiat lux. God said, let there be light. And you said there's a difference between divine fiat and carnal fiat. 
Yeah. My question would be is is fiat currency, fiat laws, um, fiat culture, is this is this a consequence of man attempting to play God? Yeah, that's precisely what's happening. Uh, just like you know, I mentioned the state has exalted themselves to godhood, whether they want to um, phrase it that way or not. They are putting themselves in the place of God and requesting things only God has authority to request. Uh, this is what's happening. So in, in the Latin translation, the translation says fiat lux. I'm not sure if it's lux or lux, probably lux, but um, right, let there be light. And so all of creation is is made from fiat. All right. Genesis one is just God saying fiat a bunch of times. All right. And into first he fiat. What's that? Speaking it into existence. Speaking it into existence by decree, by divine decree. So the implication here is that only God is capable of creating real objective value through fiat. He's created all real objective value by fiat. There's nothing in creation that was not created by fiat, by which we don't use and, uh, you know, like gold and oil. Everything we find on the earth was created by fiat. Everything we give value to was created by fiat. So so God does it. So when man does it, so there's the, there's the divine fiat, what I just discussed. Now we have what's called, what I've called the carnal fiat. This is the when man tries to decree value into existence by the simple merit of his word or his decree. Mm. And essentially, this is what fiat money is. Uh, right in the past, money was a thing by which humans had to expend some energy to uh, to on earth or or create or whatever. So in the case of gold, you you know you, you don't have guys just sitting around going uh, let there be gold. No, you got to get a shovel, you got to get out there, you got to put some work in and you unearth this gold and it's valuable now because of the energy expended uh, in in the unearthing of this thing which God created by fiat. When men say let there be money, what they're doing is playing God. And that has bad consequences. God has coded into the very creation a law, the law of sowing and reaping, right? If you want to reap a harvest, you must sow. In the case of money in the past with gold and silver or even beads or shells, whatever, you had to sow some work to reap the money. This is good in, in part of God's order of creation. This is how it ought to be. With fiat money, what you have now is men sowing, sorry, men reaping value where they've sowed no energy. Mm -hmm. And not only that, not only are they reaping where no one has sowed, they're 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 reap they're double reaping. They're reaping twice where no one has sowed. So now you have to sow in order to reap what they repped reaped with no sowing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So you're sowing for to reap something that somebody else didn't sow to reap. Right. You're working for dollars that they created without working. Yes. Yeah. And this makes no sense. Uh I, if if you were to use it if you were to use the analogy in in like uh, um um growing uh tomatoes. Imagine I reaped tomatoes without sowing and now I make you do work to reap tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make sense. That's not how the universe works. Right. It's 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 fiat money is really fundamentally a contortion of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which and again, no wonder we see such chaos. It's only been fifty what fifty two years of unfettered fiat. It's not been that long. Right. And look at the chaos that's ensuing. You got now. You got. Not only that, but like when you understand the carnal and the divine fiat, now you, you can look at different societal issues like the transgender issue and go, well, this is just carnal fiat. Like God has decreed right. you are a man, you are a woman. And now you're saying, no, God, I'm God. I decree I'm a woman and everybody has to now submit to my fiat decree. No, that's not how it works. You can't reap womanhood when you're a man. It doesn't work like that. Wonderfully said. Yeah, and it, it points to that deeper connection between money and culture, right? Something about um, 
corrupting the money corrupts the culture, corrupts the language. You know, we don't know like man is woman, woman is man. Like nothing mm. tends to make as much sense. And then, um, you know, what you said about the tomatoes, right? Someone is reaping tomatoes that they did not sow. Nobody sowed. Nobody sowed. Well, nobody so, sowed. Hey. Well, the thing is, they're sort of, they're using it to steal, right? So in the case of money pr- production, if you're the central bank and you're counterfeiting currency, you are stealing effectively wealth that other people sowed. You're reaping right. what you didn't sow. And right. so in that analogy you gave where it's like you're reaping tomatoes that, well, someone sowed them or they were there and you reaped them and then you're forcing someone else to sow tomatoes. So there's that element of unavoidable element of force in yeah in carnal fiat right that it is this is why we use the term slavery it's like what else do you call it yeah it's dependent on an asymmetric rule set right rules for me not for thee the whole system is a two-tier economic system unavoidably you can't and then and just to talk about sowing and reaping this isn't just some biblical um you know cute little thing oh you need it it's economic law or right? hate Yes. Production must proceed precede consumption. You cannot consume what has not yet been produced. This is the law of sowing and reaping. This is it's it's um, very deeply ingrained in economic science. Again, so um, yeah, I don't think many people stop to look at it that way, but they certainly should. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go to work and you sow your time and energy, but nobody thinks about. What am I sowing my time and energy to reap, right? Um, you just go, well, I sow my time and energy and I get paid in dollars and that's what I'm reaping. Well, who who created those dollars? How are they created? Who Who's reaping them? Are they sowing? Well, mm. if this becomes, I don't know, if this becomes, if people understand this, I feel like there'd be riots in the streets. I think Henry Ford or somebody said something to that effect. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, but um there are just like, there's a segment of the population who just doesn't care. They're just whatever. This is how it is. But they're not the feeling the pain comes. yet. Exactly. Till the pain comes. Yeah. And the pain is coming. It is. Uh, it's here for for, it's here. for a lot of people. It's here and it's getting worse. And we're seeing it a lot. Um, I think on, on social media, you're seeing these people with rants, like not being able to survive on one income, yep. two incomes, et cetera. So, um, Okay, I want to ask you back to kind of your Twitter stream here. You made a comment about does Jesus care about monetary policy? And I want to ask, I want to broaden the question a little bit because I know monetary metaphors and analogies are used frequently throughout the Bible. Jesus, um, you know, there's the parable of the talents, there's uh, again, a lot of the terminology about sin and redemption has kind of a monetary character to it. Yeah. What does Jesus teach us about money in general? Um, and more specifically, what does he, or does he care about monetary policy? Jesus uses money. Uh, it depends how you define parables. Some people include other stories as parables or where others don't, you know, there's certain flexibility in how many parables did Jesus actually speak. There's give or take, you know, whatever. But generally speaking, uh, 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 upwards of 25% of Jesus's parables used money as the, 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 the main um, imagery and illustration in the parables. That's like uh, I I've, I never really did the math until I was writing this book, and then I go, wow, twenty really twenty five percent, that's significant. That's a lot of parables. Like the Son of God came to Earth, and and when he wanted to teach us about the kingdom of God, he thought the best. He thought twenty five percent of the time the best metaphor to use is money. Wow, um, wow, that is that's pretty significant. And I think the reason is because he had a deep understanding of human time and energy and value. And how these things were connected. I mean, he's God. He he created this stuff. He knows how it works, mm-hmm. and so it makes total sense that he would use uh, money as this illustration because he knows how deeply ingrained this is in the human being. Mm-hmm. Work and 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 value and wealth accumulation. Everybody is to some degree um, um, working towards this, and everybody is affected by it. There's not a human being on earth that's not affected by this. 
So he uses these illustrations and and some of them, if you really stop and think, are because perhaps we grew up in in, in Western churches and this hasn't been a thing because fiat money has affected how we preach the Bible, unfortunately. But once you get this understanding of economics and Bitcoin and fiat money, you read these passages differently, uh, these parables especially. You read them differently. I mean, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is like a merchant um, in search of fine jewels. Hmm. What? The kingdom of God is like a capitalist trying to find jewelry to sell at a profit. Hmm. <laughs> That's hmm. what he says, man. Hmm. This is crazy. This is the, not what we've been taught. And when he does find one uh, uh, that's that's of tremendous value, what does he do? He goes and he sells everything he has and he buys it and he holds it. He he hodls it, if you will. <laughs> He's not letting go of this thing because he knows it's so valuable. It's so scarce. It's so precious. I have to hold it. I can't sell this. And people don't know it is, right? So I could sell all my stuff and buy it and people think they're getting a great deal. But really, I'm getting the best deal because this is the most precious thing and nobody knows it's the most precious thing. Mm -hmm. He says that that's what the kingdom is like. That's what God is like. When you have the revelation of God and of Christ, you realize, oh my gosh, I want this. And you never want to let go of it. So he's using money and value as an illustration to help us become more heavenly minded. Um, he's using the earthly uh, laws of economics to get us to understand the heavenly laws of true value. It comes from God. He made it. He's the most valuable. Thank you, Lord, for all these blessings and all the value and all the wealth we can together collaborate to 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 um, to make. But at the end of the day, I want God because He's the precious jewel, and I'm going to hold Him and never sell Him. Mm. That's yeah, so good. And I'm reminded. What is it? Buy the truth and sell it not. Is that that buy the truth and sell it not? Yeah, that's related to that. And it's you know the idea of the word right in the beginning, the word was God. I, I, I'm sorry, maybe you can quote this better than me. The word was God. The word was with God, and the word was God. Is that how it goes? Yeah, yeah. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word was God. What is a word? Right, a word is this little uh, element of language that we're using as a medium of exchange for human ideas or conceptions. Mm. So there's structurally something or dynamically something very important about language as it pertains to to God or the divine. And what is what is money, right? Well, money is another medium of exchange, but in yeah. this case, for the, the fruits of human action, right? Something a little bit... Um, a little bit more substantial than the natural language we might say, right? It carries more weight in the sense that um, it, it's a higher signal message, right? If, if someone right. sends you money versus says they're going to do something, right? You're going to tend to believe the person that's paying for the thing versus the person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, a, I have a client in my business now who owes me quite a bit of money and she keeps saying she's going to pay and she never pays. Uh, her words mean nothing. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yes. What, what if the money hits my account? Right. That speaks more than any words she could say. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so there's a real life illustration of that. Yeah. Even even the very message of the gospel itself is worded with economic language. I was going to say the the wages of sin is death. Isn't that another? Yeah. Verse, right. I mean, it, the Apostle Paul and all throughout the Bible really uses economic language to to describe salvation itself. I mean, before I was a Bitcoiner and, and, and studied these things, I remember going out on the streets and using language like this and like talking to people, hey, like Jesus paid your debt, right? Yeah. He died on the cross to to forgive your debt. Right. He, uh, he rose from the dead to redeem you, to buy you back from dark, like all these, like you you can't escape it. Right. You can't even preach the gospel of salvation without using economic language. So it's important we understand economics because we're using it to preach eternal truths. There's a reason why God uh, ha inspired his apostles to preach his message of salvation using economic language. Yes. This is, it's this universal. Is you could go anywhere in the world and people understand these concepts. Yes. And this is where it gets so fascinating for me because I, I was raised Christian, then kind of 
became atheistic, just thought it was a bunch of BS, and then actually through Bitcoin got back into it. And there's, you know, when we're talking about the way these verses and parables are being used to describe the nature of reality, it's like it's it's using phrases and examples that are actually describing complex systems in a way, right? Like words mm-hmm. and my, like it's constantly energy flowing back and forth or stocks and flows. And so it, it's almost like this ancient wisdom is actually very highly descriptive in a very high resolution way of how reality actually works. And so I don't think it's any coincidence that you know, modern economic science starts to see, oh, sowing and reaping is like, oh, that's a real economic law, right? We didn't figure that out until much later. And so it sort of uh, validates the some of the points that are being made in, in these ancient texts and ancient stories. So this is very fascinating to me. Um, and maybe that's why they're so important, right? They're just so descriptive, right? They're, they're, it's like a highest yeah. resolution description of what actually is. And Peterson talks a lot about this, like, how much density is in each one of these stories, right? Like when you have the story of Cain and Abel, how much information is packed into so few words? It's like the ultimate yeah. data compression technology, something like that. It's it's like, it's a, the Bible is one of these books, which I've not experienced this with any other book where I can just read it and read it and read it and read it and keep digging for more gems and getting more gems. It's it really is inexhaustible. You could spend your lifetime studying this thing and still not be an expert in it. Cause there's just it's there's so much going on there. I think Jordan Peterson in one of his talks, he puts up that picture of the the cross references. Yeah. Where oh, yeah, it's like a, a rainbow or whatever the colors. Yeah. And really uh that's what it is. Uh, or he calls them hyperlinks, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and it really, that's what it's like. And there's a great uh, Bible software just in passing called Logos Bible Software, where they have hyperlinked the whole Bible. So you can read through it, click, and you can click the hyperlinks. And there's literally almost an infinite amount of rabbit trails right. in like every verse that you could go down. And it makes it uh, such a rich experience. And it, you know, it's one of those books where you got to just kind of, it's, it's, it's a bit supernatural. There's nothing quite like it. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, my daughter's four and a half, and I've pretty much been reading it to her every night at bedtime, and I'm always blown away. Like I read stuff in there, like I can't believe this is in the Bible. Uh, yeah. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Crowd Health. Crowd Health is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it: legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. And I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with crowd health, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through crowd health. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the -the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. I want to talk about um, Proverbs 16.11, which uh, perhaps you can tell us what that's about. I think it has to do with just weights and measures and, um, you know, many Bitcoiners talk about this in relation to Bitcoin, right? It being kind of the first 
um, you know, we have standardized units of measurement that help us coordinate and collaborate at scale, you know, like the kilometer or the second, the hour or the inch, whatever the mile. Yet in the sphere of money, we've never had that, right? Gold was mm. kind of the approximate standard unit of measure. Fiat is obviously a highly non-standard unit of measure, considering that its supply is completely unpredictable, changing all the time and unauditable. Uh, so how do, what is the Bible have to say about just weights and measures and how does this pertain to money? Yeah. You know, a fiat money is like a tape measure that changes its measurements every few months. Yeah. Right? Try building a house when the inch keeps changing. Right. <laughs> it's a disaster. Right. Uh, so when it comes to this passage, actually Proverbs 16, 11 is like the main passage in my book I use to, um, to compare fiat and Bitcoin. It's like, okay, so here's God's standard, a just measure and equal standard and so forth. Mm -hmm. Which, which monetary network fits into this standard best fiat or Bitcoin? That's how, that's sort of the rubric I've used in the book. This, this passage, uh, can be used to describe a lot of different things. So it's used as a metaphor to um, encourage people to be honest and just in court. Uh, so, right, it's a metaphor where it's like, look, judge judge righteously, judge with a fair measure. Don't be, in, uh, don't be partial and so forth. Uh, but the literal understanding of it comes from um, money, where uh, you would weigh the money on a literal scale. And God commanded the people in Deuteronomy, he says, you must use a just and equal measure and standard. Uh, because what would happen was people would manipulate the scale, right? If they were if they were selling, they would make one side, what would, would it be lighter mm -hmm. or heavier? Anyways, they, they would manipulate it. In their own favor. Put a little, put a little weight underneath, nobody sees, so that you, you're basically robbing people on the margins now. You're selling for more, you're buying for less, and nobody knows you're doing it. Right. So that's where it comes from. And, and fiat money does this in a tremendously wide array of ways, whether it's oh, like just straight up taxation, whether it's a, a more subtle, sneaky, inflationary taxation. A fiat money is just robbing you everywhere. You work, you get robbed. You buy something, you get robbed. You want to use energy. You get robbed. You die. You get robbed. You, you it's say everywhere. You get robbed. <laughs> right. It's just, it's literally just theft on every single economic thing you want to do. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it's just constantly expanding. You know, Robert Kiyosaki said something that was just profound in its simplicity. Why would you save something someone else can print? Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's as simple as it gets. Mm -hmm. So um, so this is the principle. Bitcoin is, I think, the first, the first monetary standard we've ever had that is actually a perfectly fair and just weight. Mm -hmm. Because there's only 21 million units of Bitcoin. Well, 21 quadrillion sats. However you want to Whatever, however you want to say it, there's is a finite amount of units of Bitcoin. That's all you have. So now you can use this measuring stick to measure anything. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the same no matter what, right? Nobody has a 22 million Bitcoin long uh, uh, measuring tape. Mm -hmm. We all have the same 21 million Bitcoin measuring tape to, to, to measure economic value. It seems like this is a common sense. This is how you would want to measure economic value because it's fair and equal and everybody can can figure it out. You don't need to uh, have a you don't need to gamble in the stock market. You don't need to try to beat inflation. All you have to do is just add value and earn Bitcoin. And now you have a share of the value. Mm -hmm. And this is equal and fair and just and good and, and godly. So, you know, people will, will say things online like, uh, uh, um, as my tweets blow up, the ones that blow up, I always get these people, oh, look at this grifter. He's here to sell Bitcoin. Bro, I've never sold a Bitcoin in my life. I don't plan on it. Um, but why don't we want a, an equal and just standard? I don't get it. Are people are just so used to being robbed. Is it like a Stockholm syndrome? Have you done any interviews with any, uh, 
people that might give you some insight into why humans want to be robbed? Yeah, definitely not. I do get some fiat maxis, you might call them, which are basically statist. And they're just saying this is the way it is and not necessarily morally or ethically justifying it. Just they have a belief that that's the way it is and the way it always will be. Mm -hmm. Um, And I want to say something too, but for the economic purist out there, that we're not technically measuring value. Prices are an appraisal, like a social appraisal of value. You can't actually measure value because value is subjective. But I think the analogy still is very useful. Um, This is, I think I got this secondhand from Wittenstein through Taleb, but he says, if you use a ruler to measure a table, but you can't trust the ruler, you don't know whether you're measuring the ruler or the table. Mm. Like you need a fixed frame of reference that is consistent across time to make accurate and useful and comparable measurements. And we just simply don't have that in in the sphere of money at all uh, before Bitcoin. So it's it's a really, really big deal. Um, And on that note, I think we're getting close to time here, but I have to ask you, a very important question. <laughs> through your own lens of having written this book, through your own lens of being a pastor and you know your knowledge of the Bible and Christian teachings, Christian doctrine, how do you define money? How do you answer the question, what is money? The way I define money is that it is a technology used to store human time and energy. That would be how I would define money. And the reason I define it that way is because of um, because God made us in his image. And he's given us two finite things, time and energy. Uh, those are the scarcest assets we have. And the thing with time and energy is you don't know how much you have. That's the problem. Uh, God that doesn't tell you, okay, you have X amount of time. It's just, you have what you have. Once it's gone, it's gone. How do you spend that time and energy? What are you storing <clears throat> that time and energy in? Money. What technology are you using to store your your actually most precious t- uh, uh, commodities, time and energy? What are you using to store that in? That's money. And whatever you use to store it in is is your is your money. Amazing. And I think you said something about uh, on your your Twitter profile about how this allows us to glorify God by like actually which money we're choosing to store our time and energy in that it either either inhibits or enhances our ability to glorify God. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, <clears throat> because God made us to expand the borders of Eden. Right? That's what he said. He said, go be fruitful and multiply makes them in his image, man and woman. Then he says, go and be fruitful and multiply. What that implies is that Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden and God says, okay, I've made a little garden for you. I want you to go and expand it to cover the whole earth. That's your job now. You have a big job. I've given you everything you need to do the job. This is your job. Multiply imagers, multiply the garden. That's what you got to do. How else do you do that but with money? Money is the the tool we use, the technology we use to peacefully collaborate in our purpose for living, right? Mm -hmm. Money is the tool we use to collaborate to fulfill our very purpose, to expand Eden. So um, that glorifies God because God made you to do that. And when you store your time and energy in a money that is fundamentally ungodly, that, that, um, rebels against God's standards, that does not glorify God because it doesn't it doesn't e- efficiently fulfill your mandate, what God made you to do and to and to be. Uh, and which is why we see, you know, like the, the guys like Saifedean, Dr. Saifedean Moose writes his book, The Fiat Standard, and Jimmy Song wrote a book now called uh, uh, Fiat Ruins Everything. And these men are showing us very um very skillfully how when the money's corrupted, everything else seems to get corrupted along with it. Mm -hmm. So that does not glorify God when his imagers are hurting each other, being violent, being, you know, perverse and 
and not expanding Eden, but instead expanding hell. So this this really goes uh, quite deep and is is very spiritual and moral. And so once your mind gets open to this, and I hope the church can 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 see this and receive this, because I really think it will help us to um, accelerate the the growth of God's kingdom on earth. That's really why I'm in Bitcoin is because I've realized what money is, and we need to have a good and moral money if we want to um, see humanity flourish. I think that's a beautiful place to put a button on it. Um, Pastor Allen, thank you so much. Where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on Twitter at, at Pastor Coin. That, let me just quickly say, that that name, Pastor Coin, um, was initially, I started this account as kind of a joke, but it, I can't really leave it now, so... <laughs> Pastor Coin, it is. Um, so yeah, Pastor Coin, you can find me online. Uh, my website, thebibleandbitcoin.com. Get the book on Amazon, all the different Amazon marketplaces. If you'd like to buy bulk copies to hand out to your Christian friends, please DM me or go to the website. You can buy ten uh, at a discount with only with Bitcoin, though. Uh, I'm only accepting Bitcoin for now for bulk orders, and the reason is because the fiat. Payment processors are just too expensive. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's just more practical. It's actually just more practical from a business point of view to just accept Bitcoin for these books. It just it makes more sense. Just again showing how superior Bitcoin is to to fiat. So yeah, Twitter, the website, and uh, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Thanks again for doing this. Thank you. Appreciate it.